The serial killer Ted Bundy became a global spectacle when he was prosecuted for his gruesome crimes on live television. As these live pictures unfolded, many people quickly realized that there was something mysteriously different about Bundy. Bundy generally came across as a sensible and charming, kind person, which are all qualities that many of us seek out in partners and friendship. But then there were moments where Bundy would arrogantly mock the court proceedings while also showing a chilling disregard for the victims and their families. Bundy even decided to serve his own attorney, discarding every legal advice he was given, effectively self-sabotaging his chances in court. He was later found guilty and sentenced to death, with the judge famously describing Bundy as extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile. According to experts in forensic psychology, Ted Bundy was absolutely no ordinary offender. He exemplifies what they clinically refer to as a psychopath. Psychopaths has, have been described as social predators who are completely lacking in conscience and in feelings for others. Psychopathic individuals may seem normal, as did Bundy, but this outer appearance of normality is just a carefully constructed play act. It's an imitation, if you will. It's their way of masking an underlying predatory personality profoundly deprived of a moral compass. Today, the most relied upon method to clinically assess or identify psychopaths like Ted Bundy is the so-called hair psychopathy checklist revised, or in short, the PCLR. This diagnostic checklist consists of 20 personality and behavioral items meant to describe a stereotypical psychopath. For example, the checklist describes psychopathic personality as grandiose, remorseless, shallow, and lacking empathy. And their behavior is described as socially parasitic, impulsive, and criminally versatile. In practice, the checklist is used by assessing to what degree a patient matches these 20 traits. If there's a substantial degree of resemblance, such a person is then clinically diagnosed as a psychopath. For a comparison, forensic psychologists often describe Ted Bundy as a near-perfect match. Many judiciary and correctional systems across the world, including the US and Canada, acknowledge the use of the PCLR. And this is because psychopaths are believed to be qualitatively different from ordinary offenders. But how different are psychopaths really, you might ask? And why are these alleged differences relevant in the legal context? According to the developers of the PCLR, psychopaths deviate from the average offender in at least three fundamental ways, which in turn may or may not influence their legal processes. First, Psychopaths are believed to be extremely dangerous. So, for example, if, if an offender is clinically diagnosed as a psychopath, this may inform the decision on whether the offender should be admitted into a high-risk facility or whether he should be granted parole. Secondly, it's commonly believed that psychopaths don't change, that they are unresponsive to treatment and rehabilitation efforts. The psychopaths may therefore be excluded from inmate rehabilitation programs. And in the US, for instance, this belief about chronicity has been also been used to argue that juvenile psychopathic offenders should be transferred into adult courtrooms. The third and final claim is that psychopaths lack conscience, that they don't feel remorse and empathy and are therefore unable to make proper moral judgments. So this may inform a judge or a jury about the offender's character, which can impact a variety of decisions such as the sentencing deliberation. It is largely because of these three claims and their potential forensic implication that the PCLR has been repeatedly called the single most important psychological assessment in the criminal justice system. So far, all of this sounds very intuitive, perhaps. There is a basic demand in the legal system to manage extremely dangerous offenders, and the PCLR simply helps us identify who they are. However, while this way of using and implementing the PCLR might seem intuitive, it doesn't necessarily follow that it's also unproblematic. So why is that? Well, consider first that it is estimated that on a global scale, hundreds of thousands of individuals are assessed every year using the PCLR. 
And many of these people are, as a consequence of this diagnosis, being treated differently in the criminal justice system. So that's all clear. But here is a potential problem. If we treat psychopaths differently based on the claims made by forensic psychologists that they are extremely dangerous, untreatable, without conscience, then it's absolutely essential that this is also true. So if we actually went ahead and scrutinized these three claims, we should find that those who are clinically diagnosed as psychopaths also fit this general description, at least to some reasonable or substantial degree. On the other hand, if it turns out that those individuals we diagnose are, in fact, no more dangerous than ordinary offenders, then the use of the PCLR would be unjustified and therefore amount to plain legal discrimination, since it would mean that these hundreds of thousands of individuals are still being managed as if they are extremely dangerous, such as, for instance, being placed in high-risk institutions or being denied parole and so forth. This short analysis demonstrates how high the stakes really are when it comes to implementing a tool like the psychopathy checklist. Either the assessment is justifiably contributing to making society safer, or it's a vessel for discriminatory practices. In theory, only one of these two stories can be true. So which one is it? Approximately one and a half year ago, my colleagues and I set ourselves the task of thoroughly answering this basic question, whether psychopaths truly are extremely dangerous, untreatable, and without conscience. To do so, we systematically reviewed the past 25 years of research, scrutinizing and aggregating the results of hundreds of studies involving thousands of imprisoned psychopaths. Our study was recently published in the peer-reviewed journal, Psychology, Public Policy, and Law. And in terms of the study's content, it's one of the most comprehensive reviews ever to be published in the field of psychopathy studies. And here's what we found. In terms of assessing levels of dangerousness in psychopaths, this is typically done by tracking and comparing post-release recidivism. So for example, if psychopaths are faster than non-psychopathic offenders to commit new crimes after being released from prison, this is then interpreted as higher levels of risk or dangerousness. We found that there was some evidence that psychopaths, compared to average offenders, are statistically more likely to engage in post-release criminal activities. However, to our surprise, the data only suggested a weak to moderately higher probability. To illustrate what this data actually tells us, picture a hypothetical group of offenders who criminally recidivate at some point in time after being released from prison. In this group, some individuals will do so after only a few weeks, where others will take much longer, perhaps even years. A normal distribution of this data may look something like this, where the right side represents those who recidivate relatively quicker, and to the left, those who are relatively longer to recidivate. If we compare this to the average data on psychopathic offenders, the picture generally looks something like this. Obviously, this is a simplified way of representing the data. But as we can see, these two groups have far more in common than what differentiates them. And I assume we can all agree that this difference can hardly justify calling the one group ordinary offenders and calling the other group extremely dangerous predators. Now, in terms of the second claim about untreatability or chronicity, the way this is typically studied is to compare whether psychopaths make therapeutic progress or whether treatment programs have any positive effects on criminal behavior. We found no evidence that psychopaths are unresponsive to treatment and rehabilitation efforts. Actually, there were positive results across intervention methods that mirrored progress in other offenders. This included positive gains from cognitive and behavioral therapy, for example, such as learning to better control aggressive impulses. In short, contrary to the common beliefs that psychopaths are chronic, psychopaths can actually be rehabilitated in similar ways as other offenders. 
In terms of the third claim that psychopaths are morally incapacitated, we were particularly interested in studies that analyze psychopaths' conscience, empathy, and moral judgments. And here, we were quite frankly amazed by our findings. And again, not in a good way. First, we were unable to find a single empirical study measuring conscience in psychopaths. This was especially surprising since the most read and cited book about psychopaths is entitled Without Conscience. How can scientists claim to know that psychopaths lack conscience if they have never attempted to measure it? We then reviewed the research on psychopaths' capacity to empathize. For example, a typical empathy study measures whether psychopaths can correctly identify the emotion in facial expressions, say the difference between sadness and fearfulness. However, not a single study showed that psychopaths had any clear differences, let alone severe impairments of empathic capacities. Finally, we analyzed dozens of studies on how psychopaths make moral judgments. This included research on whether psychopaths perceive moral situations differently, as well as studies testing responses to ethically complex questions. For instance, consider the question, is it morally permissible to steal medicine to save a sick person's life? While you might think that this is a complex question, studies actually show that there's a remarkable similarity in how most people answer those questions. So if psychopaths really do lack a moral compass, then it's at least reasonable to expect that their answers could be different. However, across multiple studies, psychopaths did not show any difficulties in making moral judgments. Instead, their performances merely reflected those of ordinary people. Our study is the first ever to take a systematic and integrative look into the three common descriptions of psychopaths. And there's really no way we can sugarcoat the results. We found that all three claims were either largely or entirely unjustified. What this actually means is that the individuals we assess or identify as psychopaths in the criminal justice system, for instance, by using the PCLR, do not actually fit the common description of psychopath. In other words, the narrative we tell about psychopaths is simply not anchored in reality. It's nothing but fiction. Now, there's an almost unimaginable number of ways that this fiction about psychopaths can create problems in the legal context. As mentioned, it may contribute to parole applications being denied or affect sentencing recommendations. But consider also that some studies in the US have found that describing a person as a psychopath predicts your support for capital punishment. It's likely that using the checklist in some cases could be a matter of life and death. Obviously, these type of decisions, or any other forensic decisions for that matter, should not be based on fiction. And when we mistakenly do so, this ought then to be rectified in one way or the other, right? If this is the case, if this is our viewpoint, then it's quite possible that we have in front of us a problem which could have overwhelming legal, professional, and ethical consequences. Because what do we do with cases where the PCLR has played a defining role? Should denied parole applications be reevaluated? Must we allow guilty individuals to request a new trial on the ground of prejudicial evidence? What about psychopathic juveniles who were transferred to adult courts? Should they be transferred back? If so, what if they're no longer in their adolescence? And how will all of this impact the credibility of our profession? Now, some of you might be asking yourself here towards the end, is he really telling me that the Ted Bundys of our communities are no more dangerous than other criminals? Of course not. Obviously, there are people out there that are more dangerous than others, and nothing could be more evident when faced with serial killers like Ted Bundy. But while we can easily call these people psychopaths, it is an entirely different task to develop instruments that can identify them with scientific precision. 
something that the PCLR aims to be doing, but nevertheless fails at. Yet the assessment still has the legally compromising effects on a presumably vast number of people. Therefore, I believe we must immediately halt and seriously reconsider the current widespread use of the hair psychopathy checklist revised. Thank you.